Have you ever seen the old movie classic, Little Lord Fauntleroy? Have you ever seen that, that movie? You know, I get to see all those because my kids like those, those old movies. It's about a little boy from New York City who inherited his deceased father's position, title, and future riches, including an estate with a castle on it in England. The only condition that he had to meet in order to receive the inheritance was that he had to go to England and live with his grandfather, the actual lord of the estate. Well, once he was there, the grandfather became quite fond of him and his lack of royal trappings. He looked forward to turning the entire estate over to little Lord Fauntleroy, the young boy from New York City. However, this prospect was not without a challenge as one day the grandfather received a telegram that another young boy was challenging little Lord Fauntleroy's claim to the inheritance. Now, only one of these boys was the rightful heir and only the rightful heir would be able to receive the inheritance. Did you know that if you are a genuine child of God, that you too have an inheritance waiting for you in heaven? In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, Peter writes this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away reserved in heaven for you. So if you are truly born again, you are a true child of God, you have a divine inheritance reserved in heaven in your name. Now, aren't you the least bit curious about that inheritance? Aren't you the least bit curious about what that means? What is it that's actually reserved in your name? Are you even now enjoying the prospect of what your future inheritance holds for you? Well, in Colossians chapter 1, and we're going to start where we left off last week, verse 12, Colossians chapter 1, verse 12, Paul brings up this issue of the Colossian believer's inheritance. Now, he does so in the context of a prayer. He's been praying for these believers in Colossae from verse 9, and he'll end it a little bit later, but he brings this up in the context of a prayer. Now, here's where an understanding of the historical context of this book of Colossians is going to be extremely helpful in understanding what Paul has in mind in reminding these believers in his prayer about their heavenly inheritance. You see, the Colossian church had been infiltrated with false teachers and false teaching, which had caused them to doubt whether simple faith in Christ, their faith in Christ, was really enough to qualify them to go to heaven. You see, these false teachers had brought in false teaching, which said that faith in Christ was really too simplistic, that what you needed was a sophisticated, superior wisdom based not on the Scriptures, but on Greek philosophy, as well as a religious system that was characterized by asceticism, rigid self-denial, harsh treatment of the body, special diets. I had a guy named Atkins back there. Did you know the Atkins? Yeah, no, forget it. Just kidding. Forget it. <laughs> it actually worked. I just got tired of eating meat. No. Ceremonial rules and legalism. See, this false philosophy had infiltrated the church. And so these teachers and this teaching were telling the believers that were saying, listen, we have faith in Christ, so we're going to heaven. And the false teachers would say, oh, no, no, you're not. I I mean, that's just an introduction into this. But certainly, you can't believe that having simple childlike faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is going to get you to heaven. It's interesting, this week I had a discussion with a man who was dying. And we, we, we talked for an hour and a half about faith in Christ and about going to heaven. And we had a wonderful discussion. And, and we started out in the discussion and he said, I just can't believe that by simply trusting Christ and, 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 and believing in Christ that that can somehow change my life and change my eternal destiny. At the end of the hour and a half, he said, would you please come back in a couple of weeks? Let's talk more. Let's talk more. We well, see these false teachers and this false teaching was saying to the believers that your faith is not enough. And so Paul, in combating this false philosophy, states in this verse 
that God has qualified these believers and it is going to be based on faith in Christ. Let's look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 12. Giving thanks to the Father. Now, that's where we, we stopped last week. Giving thanks to the Father for the trials that we are enduring. And that's the only way that you will be able to endure trials joyously is if you give thanks to the Father. And by way of review, the reason for that is because when you give thanks to the Father for what you're going through, you are acknowledging and you are affirming that He's in control of that. And therefore, that thing is good. It is not bad, even though it appears to be bad at the time. That God is going to cause all things to work together for good to those who love Jesus, who are called according to His name. But then he says this, giving thanks to the Father, and then he qualifies who the Father is, who has qualified us. Here's who you're giving thanks to. The one who has qualified you or qualified me, qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. For He rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. What Paul wants these believers to understand is that in spite of the fact that the false teachers are saying you need to do this and this and this and then you need to do a little bit more of this and you need to do this to be saved, he's saying, no guys, what you need to understand is that the Father has already qualified you to go to heaven. You don't need to keep doing and doing and doing and trying to achieve and trying to earn acceptance with God. Christ did that for you at the cross of Calvary. Well, this morning we're going to take a look at this inheritance because I don't know that we as believers really understand what our inheritance is. What is it that He qualified us for? Now, before we look at the inheritance, I want you to go with me to Hebrews chapter 10 for just a moment. There's another reason why... (coughs) Paul is talking about an inheritance. Remember, we had just come out of the context of talking about suffering joyously. These people are just like you and me. They suffer. They go through things in life that they don't understand. They shed tears over loved ones. They, they die. They get sick. They have tragedies, just like we do. They were going through suffering. And Paul has told them that they need to suffer joyously. And again, keep in mind, anybody can suffer. God doesn't call the Christian to just suffer. The God calls the Christian to suffer joyously. Even a non-Christian world suffers. The difference between their suffering and our suffering is that we are to suffer joyously as we characterize God's work in our lives. That He has a purpose in all this. Well, look at Hebrews chapter 10 for just a moment. And look at verse 32. But remember the former days. Here's the writer of Hebrews talking to some Christians. He says, remember the former days when after being enlightened, you endured a great conflict of sufferings, partly by being made a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations, and partly by becoming sharers with those who were so treated. For you showed sympathy to the prisoners. You accepted joyfully the seizure of your property. Now, here's people who have suffered for Christ. They're losing their property. These are people who are going to lose their health because they're going to be going to prison. They're going to be beat for the name of Christ. They're losing things for the name of Christ. And listen to this last phrase. Knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and a lasting one. Here's the other reason why Paul is talking about the inheritance. Unless you understand that what you possess, really possess, is up there and not here, you will never be willing to lose what you have here. Never. You will hold on to what you have on this life with a closed fist because you think this is all there is. So you're going to hold on to your property. You're going to hold on to your health. You're going to hold on to your money. You're going to hold on to your position. You're going to hold on to your reputation. Never sacrificing anything for Christ because for you, this is all there is. And so he says these people were willing to give it up because they knew where their treasure was. They knew that their inheritance was not on this earth. Although you're going to find out that the inheritance in part will be this earth. But their inheritance is safe. It's reserved. It's unfading. It's imperishable in heaven in their name. Again, for you showed sympathy to prisoners. You accepted joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and a lasting one. Therefore, don't throw away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance. So that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. For yet in a very little while, 
He who is coming will come and he will not delay. Revelation 22, 12 tells us he who is coming is going to come and what's he going to have with him? His reward, which is going to be our reward. But my righteous one shall live by faith. If he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but of those who have faith to the preserving of the soul. You know, unless you believe that you have a divine heavenly inheritance, unless you believe that your treasure, your real treasure, and what you really possess is in heaven for all of eternity for you to enjoy, you'll never be willing to let go of the puny little trinkets that you have on earth. And the sad thing about Christians, to some respect, all of us, is that we get this narrow tunnel vision and we want to hold on to our trinkets forgetting that we have treasure in heaven, right? We get so hung up on the trinkets of earth. Well, let's go back to Colossians chapter chapter 1. And we're going to take a look this morning, first of all, at the nature of the inheritance. What actually is this inheritance that Paul is thanking God for on our behalf? Every genuine child of God has received a divine inheritance which is reserved in heaven for him or her. That does not mean that you do not experience part of your inheritance now. You're all experiencing part of that right now. But there are other aspects of this inheritance that you will not experience until you get to heaven. But the interesting thing is this. You have already obtained the right to it. If you're a child of God, you are an heir of God, Romans 8:17 says, and a co-heir of who? Christ. Now, I don't know if you understand what that means. That means that everything that is Christ is... Anybody want to be bold enough to say it? Ours. Everything. You are a co-heir of Christ. The reason why you were adopted into God's family so that He could be the firstborn among many brethren is because God sees you as actually a brother of Christ. You are a co-heir of Christ and everything that is Christ is going to be yours. Can you believe that? Some of you have a look on your face like, my word, where'd you get that heresy? I'll show you a little bit later. Okay. (laughs) Where I get all my heresies, they're right here. The nature of the inheritance. What is he giving thanks to the Father for? Number one, and if you're using the outline, there's there's several blanks that you can fill in. We're not going to look at all of these in detail or we'll be here all day, which is fine with me, but some of you have plans, okay? It would just keep me out of going to work this afternoon, which I wouldn't mind at all. Number one is salvation. Your salvation is part of your inheritance. And we see that over in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 4. Again, I'm going to list these for you. You can look these up because what I want to get to is the next couple points. Salvation. Your very salvation is reserved in heaven for you. You know, the interesting thing about salvation is this. You and I have been saved from the power of sin. We have been saved from the penalty of sin. But you know what? There's a future aspect of our salvation, which is to be saved from what? The presence of sin. And we don't experience that until heaven. Can you imagine, like I've asked you many times, what it would be like to live in a sphere, to live in a a life in which you are not affected by sin in any way, shape, or form, and no one else is either. Where every thought that you think is pure and wonderful and clean. Every emotion that you feel. I mean, we can't comprehend that kind of an existence. Salvation is part of the inheritance. You're, going to receive, you're experiencing part of it now. You're going to receive even more later. The next one, spiritual resources and riches. Spiritual resources and riches. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, it says that we have been blessed with every spiritual resource, every spiritual blessing. It's already yours. That's why Paul says that you and I are complete in Christ. You see, these Gnostic false teachers were coming into the church and they were saying, you're not complete in Christ. You need more. And God is saying through Paul, you already have everything you need. Every spiritual resource and blessing. Spiritual promises. Look over to Hebrews 6, verse 12 for just a moment. That's, I want you to see that one. You know, you, you hear today, you hear on especially charismatic TV and different things like that. You hear, and you hear people all throughout the Christian community saying, you need to claim the promises. Guys, I've got to tell you something. You already have the promises. Whether you claim them or not, they are yours. This idea that I've got to claim the promises of God or else I'm not going to receive them. You already have the promises of God. They're yours. Look at Hebrews chapter 6, verse 12. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 12. 
He's saying, so that you will not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. When you placed your faith in Christ, when you trusted Him for your salvation, you inherited the promises of God. Those promises are yours. The next thing that you have as part of your inheritance is eternal life. You inherited eternal life. Now, you know, let's talk about eternal life. You know, I was talking to this man this week. The, the concept that he had, he said, you know, I, I just can't understand how it could be that, that you could live forever. In fact, who would want to live forever? Well, obviously, in this state, I don't know who would want to live forever. But, you know, eternal life is a whole lot more than that. Look at John chapter 17, verse 3. What is eternal life? John 17, verse 3. We think that eternal life is going to heaven, walking on streets of gold and living in the mansions that Christ is preparing for us. And it is. But keep in mind, heaven is just a place. This is what eternal life is. In John 17, 3, Jesus said this, this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Eternal life is knowing God. It's being in a relationship to and with God. That's what eternal life is. And the interesting thing about your inheritance is this, is as you and I grow in Christ, our capacity to know God increases. Thus, we not only know Him in a better and fuller way, but we enjoy Him in a much fuller and greater way. And when you and I get to heaven and sin is removed, our capacity to know God is going to be unfathomable. Can you imagine what it would be like to know God and to experience God in that state? E, if you're using the outline, the next part of our inheritance is heaven itself. We will be in this place called heaven. The Scripture is there for you to look at. F, earth. Go with me to Matthew chapter 5, 5. Look at Matthew 5, verse 5. You know, this is what gives me comfort when I look at where I live, Dry Gulch. We now have Deadwood. We're going to name where I live Dry Gulch. Barren, brown, tumbleweed infested, flat, artificial trees. Oh, no, I, no, I don't have a bad attitude toward Edgewood. No. But you know what gives me comfort? And I, when I tell Nancy, I say, you know, Nancy, when we, when we get ready to retire, I really hope the Lord takes us somewhere where it is green and blue. And I don't mean blue sky. I mean blue water and green grass. I say, that, that's really all I'm going to ask for, something like that, where the wind does not blow and tumbleweeds don't pile up 10 feet high in your chicken yard. Okay, that'd be, that'd be fine with me. And what gives me comfort is that someday the Bible says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 5, and these are the characteristics of a believer. It says, blessed are the gentle, the meek. Now, now don't mistake meekness for weakness. You know that. The word here is protes. It's power under control. This is the character of a believer. Their power is under the control of the Spirit of God. It says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. You know, there's really no reason for you to grab and claw and fight for everything you can on this earth if you're a believer. One day, one day God promises you, you know what, you're going to inherit this ball of mud. But it's going to be restored the way God originally created it before the fall. I wonder what Edgewood will look like then. You know, now, here's the bad part. What if the original creation was like Edgewood and all the rest of this stuff was a mutation? That'd be terrible. We'll inherit the earth. You wonder why I don't ever make it running for the Chamber of Commerce in Edgewood, huh? Just kidding. The next thing, and this is probably the most important part of the whole inheritance, God Himself. Go with me to Psalm 16, verse 5. Psalm 16, verse 5. Sometimes we get caught up in in the things of the inheritance. Man, what what kind of riches and blessings and things like that are we going to inherit? Here's here's the real primary aspect of the inheritance. Look at Psalm 16, verse 5. The Lord is the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You support my lot. I think NIV puts it a little bit different. New American Standard is probably a little more literal rendering of the Hebrew. Look over at Psalm 73, 26. Psalm 73, verse 26. 
My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. That word for portion that's found in both of those texts of Scripture is the Hebrew equivalent, the English translation of the Hebrew equivalent for inheritance. In other words, what it's saying is that, you know what, the greatest part of your, your inheritance is God Himself. God is your inheritance. Now, look with me over at Lamentations 3.24 and it helps explain that just a little bit. Lamentations 3, verse 24. If you keep going to the right in your Bible, you'll come to Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, chapter 3, verse 24. Jeremiah writes Lamentations and he's writing after the city of Jerusalem has been destroyed, everybody has been taken away except a few that have been left, the buildings, everything has been destroyed. He's walking through the smoldering ashes of the city of Jerusalem. And he says in Lamentations 3, verse 24, something that's very profound. He says this. In fact, let's back up to verse 19. Remember my affliction and my wandering, the wormwood and the bitterness. Surely my soul remembers and is bowed down within me. This I recall to my mind. Therefore, I have hope. The Lord's loving kindness is indeed never cease. His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Now, we love that verse, right? Here's why. You need to always attach verse 24 to that plaque that you have that says that His compassions are new every morning and great is faithfulness. This has to be attached. The Lord is my portion. My inheritance says my soul. Therefore, I have hope in Him. The word actually meant something like this. The Lord is all I get because the Lord is all I need. It was a word which was used when the people would have to ration out food. If they were going through a famine, if they were going through a time when there was not enough food for people, people would line up and someone would take out a little ladle and a little soup and put it in the bowl and that person would look up and say, I want more. And the person who's in charge of dishing out the food would use this word and it would mean this. This is all you get because this is all you need to make it through the day. And so that word was used here and what it's saying is this. The Lord is all you're promised because the Lord is all you need. Now, if you're here today and you're saying, well, man, that sounds cool, but I want the riches. I want the golden streets. I want the mansions. I want that stuff. Now, that'll come that only comes to a person who treasures God. You see, if if you're in it for what you can get and for all the riches and all the glory, and you've come to Christ for all that Christ can give you, then maybe you really haven't come to Christ at all. Because those things belong to the person who's come to Christ for Christ's sake. Because they desire Him and they cherish Him. It's very important to understand that Paul's mentioning of the believer's inheritance is a means of encouraging believers who are not only being influenced by false teaching, but they're not complete in Christ, but are finding it a little bit hard to persevere and endure through their trials joyfully. And so God wants us to understand that our real riches, our real identity, our real health, our real position is really untouchable. Regardless of what you may be losing today, regardless of how you may be feeling today, the real you and what is really yours for all of eternity is untouchable. It is reserved in heaven for you. Now, I want you to go back, or you should probably still be there in Colossians chapter 1. Let's go ahead and look at how we are qualified. Look at how we're going to be qualified. It's really interesting, very simple. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us. Who's the one that did the qualifying? The Father qualified us for the inheritance. We didn't qualify ourselves for this inheritance. Now, the word qualify comes from a Greek word which means to make adequate, to make someone sufficient for, or to qualify somebody for something. And so, what it's saying here is that God is the one who's being thanked because He's the one who has made us sufficient for this inheritance. He's made us adequate for it. He has qualified us for it. Now, it's an aorist active participle. It's used as an adverbial. Now, I'm not going to explain what that means, only to say this. 
is that the timing of when God qualified us is indefinite. You can't put an exact time on it. And the reason why is because there are three times when God qualified us for our inheritance. I don't know if you realize it or not. You may say, well, I thought He qualified me for my inheritance when I accepted Him as my Lord and Savior. He did. But there's two other aspects of your qualification, two other aspects or stages that we need to look at. The first one is this. God qualified all His heirs before creation. He qualified all His heirs before creation. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. Ephesians 1, verse 11. If you've got the NIV, I've got to be very honest with you, I, I do not have any idea where the NIV got the first phrase. Literally in a Greek text, it reads this way, also we have obtained an inheritance. It does not say in the Greek text that we were chosen having been predestined. The Greek text says, also we have obtained an inheritance. And if you've got the NIV, you should have a little footnote there that has that reading and says this is an alternate reading. Again, I don't know where they got theirs. But if you look at the King James, the New King James, you look at the New American Standard, you look at a Greek text, it's going to read this way. We have obtained an inheritance. Now, here's what I want you to see. Also, we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to his purpose who works all things after the counsel of his will. Now, predestined is a compound word. Pro arizo. Pro means beforehand. Orizo means to mark out the boundaries. It means to be marked out beforehand. And so what it's saying is this, that we have obtained an inheritance having been marked out beforehand according to His purpose who works all things after the counsel of His will. Well, when did God do this marking out beforehand? When did He make this decision to mark out beforehand or to decree or to determine that you're going to receive an inheritance. Well, look up at Ephesians chapter 1. Look at verse 4. Look at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself according to the kind intention of His will. Now stop for just a second. To, be, to receive an inheritance, you have to be an heir. If you're a co-heir with Christ, that means you're going to have to be adopted into God's family as a son in that position of sonship alongside Jesus Christ. He's the real son. We're the adopted sons. That's the only way we can receive the inheritance is to be adopted into the family of God. And he says that this took place just as God chose us. So it's saying just as God chose us in him before the foundation of the world, he also predestined us. This predestination took place before creation as well. And so you have the first aspect, you were qualified before creation. Now, what does it mean when it says that he chose us that we would be holy and blameless before him? Go with me to Colossians chapter 1, verse 21. Colossians chapter 1, verse 21. He uses the same terminology. Look at Colossians 1 and look at verse 21. And although you, speaking to the believers in Colossians, in Colossae, speaking about every believer, and although you were formerly alienated, and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds. In other words, you were once an unbeliever. Verse 22, Yet He has now reconciled you in His fleshly body through death in order to present you before Him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. In other words, you who were formerly alienated, hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, an unbeliever, He has saved you. In the description of the salvation, that which characterizes it is your holy, blameless, and beyond reproach. That's the same expressions except for the beyond reproach that's used in Ephesians chapter 1 when he says, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In other words, when God chose you 
to salvation, He also predestined that you would become adopted into His family, become a co-heir with Christ, an heir of God. Go ahead and look with me over at Romans chapter 8. Look at Romans 8. Romans 8. Look at verse 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to become, look, conformed to the image of His Son so that He would be the firstborn among many brethren. So God predestined back before creation that we would be adopted into His family and that we would be conformed to the image of His Son. Why? So that we could receive the inheritance. So that we could be a co-heir of Christ and an heir of God. Now, all of this, when you look at Romans 8, 28, and 29, um, that all happens before creation. In verse 30, And these whom He predestined, He also called. That's where it happens in our time. That day or that moment or that hour when you actually came to Christ. So what I want you to see, first of all, is that you obtained an inheritance before creation. But let me say this. If that's all there was, you wouldn't be saved. You have a group called hyper-Calvinism. Hyper-Calvinist. I was looking at a website the other day. Man, I wouldn't want to be... Oh, here's what they say. They say that because God chose before the foundation of the world, and because God predestined before the foundation of the world that you don't even need to hear, hear or receive the gospel to be saved. Because of the choosing, it's all, it, that's all there is. You don't need to do anything. There's no need to take the gospel to anyone because no one needs to hear the gospel. That's not what that's saying. But it is saying that the first aspect of our inheritance was obtained before creation. Now let's go to the second aspect of our inheritance. Go back to Colossians chapter 1. God qualified all His heirs before creation and God qualified all His heirs at the cross. He qualified all His heirs at the cross. Look what it says in verse 13 and 14. For He rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. Had God simply predestined believers to be conformed to the image of His Son, and thus be co-heirs of Christ, they still would not have received the inheritance if Christ had not gone to the cross and died. Christ had to go to the cross and He had to do the work which would allow God to qualify us as His heirs. Romans 3, 4 puts it this way, being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. In other words, you and I are justified because we are redeemed in Christ. Now look at verse 13 again. For He rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. When Christ went to the cross of Calvary and He took upon Himself our sins, all the sins that you've committed, all the sins that I've committed, and He paid for those sins, that enabled God the Father to rescue us from the domain of darkness and transfer us into the kingdom of His Son. That enabled Him to forgive us and still be just and the justifier of us. Now, the reason for that is this, is because these two little words in verse 14 where it says, in whom we have redemption. The word redemption is a word which means to deliver by payment of a ransom. It was used to speak of freeing slaves from bondage by making a payment. Now, keep in mind, we were slaves to sin. Now, when Christ went to the cross of Calvary, the payment was not paid to Satan. It was not paid to sin. His death was a payment to God's wrath and God's justice and God's holiness. And when God was satisfied with the payment that was made, which was Jesus Christ, He was then enabled to forgive us. Go with me to Romans chapter 3. Look at Romans chapter 3. If you look at Romans chapter 3, why did God have to send Jesus to the cross? It says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We know that to be true. 
being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation or a satisfaction in His blood through faith. This was to demonstrate His righteousness, God's righteousness, because in the forbearance of God He had passed over sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of His righteousness at the present time, so that He would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Christ. The reason why God had to send Christ to the cross of Calvary to bear our sin and become our sin penalty was because He could not forgive us unless that payment was made. And so Christ, in going to the cross, enabled God to justify us and still remain just. Now, again, redemption. It means to free slaves from bondage. It has the idea of freeing a person from their sins. In other words, separating them from their sins so that there's no more connection between them and their sins. But the interesting thing about the Word, it has the idea of not only separating you from your sins, but separating you from everything your sins have in connection with you, such as shame and guilt. So it's not enough to say to a person who comes to Christ, listen, you've been forgiven of your sins and you're separated from your sins. They're also separated from the guilt of those sins. And so if you have a person who's accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, but they continually go back in the past and they're digging up those old skeletons, bringing them out of the closet, you've got to say to them, listen, you've been forgiven of those sins. You've been separated from those sins as well as the guilt of those sins. It's gone. But now look at the rest of the verse. It says, in whom we have redemption... The forgiveness of sins. Here he wants us to understand that redemption produces the forgiveness of sins. Now, this word for forgiveness is another Greek word, and it actually means to separate your sins from you. So, in redemption, you're separated from your sins. In forgiveness, they're separated from you. The point he's trying to make is this, is that the cross of Calvary the price that Christ paid on that cross separated you completely from your sins in every aspect that you can think of. You've been separated from them and they've been separated from you. That's why it says in the Bible, as far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgressions from us. Micah 7.19 He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. Yes, Thou will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. You see, God couldn't have forgiven you and I otherwise unless we had been separated from those sins. The penalty had been paid. So He qualified us before creation by predestining us to be conformed to the image of His Son, to become His child, to become an heir. He qualified us at the cross by taking care of our sin problem. But there's a third aspect which if this doesn't take place, you still will not receive your inheritance. God qualified all His heirs at their conversion. He qualified all His heirs at their conversion the moment you came to Christ. I want you to look. Stay there in Colossians 1.12 and look with me at Acts chapter 26. Look at Acts 26. Now, here's where those of you that don't like the choosing part will like this part. Okay? Okay? Look at Acts chapter 26. 15 through 20. Paul's preaching here. And uh, he's giving his defense to Festus. And he says in Acts 26, verse 15, and I said, he's telling the story how he got saved. And I said, who are you, Lord? This is when the Lord struck him down and blinded him. And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But get up and stand on your feet for this purpose. I have appeared to you to appoint you a minister and a witness, not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things which I will appear to you, rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you. Now listen to verse 18 and see if this doesn't sound like Colossians 1.12. I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God. Now, hold it. In Colossians 1.12, who turned who? God turned them. 
God qualified them. God did the rescuing. God did the turning. God did the qualifying. But here in Acts chapter 26, verse 18, these people are supposed to be turning from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. Now look at verse 19. So King Agrippa, I do not pro- did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision, but kept declaring both to those of Damascus, Damascus first and also Jerusalem, and then throughout all the region of Judea, and even to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds appropriate to repentance. Here's the deal. It's like this, this quarter. Remember the quarter illustration? How many sides are there of this quarter? As far as I know, well, you know, I know if you're real, into, like we talked about phys- physics last week, I'm sure you can come up with a, who knows the dozens, but let's just be simple here. Two. Mine is an old one. It's got the head of George Washington, and then there's an eagle on the back of the quarter. Now, I don't know about you, but I can only see one side of this quarter at the same time. At one time. Okay, when I look and I see the eagle, I see the eagle. I do not see the head of George Washington. When I look at the head of George Washington, I see that side, but I cannot see the eagle. But is the other side there? Just because I can't see it does not mean it's not there. And sometimes we struggle with this whole concept. We say, well, you were predestined before the foundation of the world. That's what the Bible says. Yes, but you, were, you received your inheritance when you came to Christ in 1987. That's true. Well, which one is it? Both. You had to be predestined before the creation of the world to receive your inheritance, to be saved. Christ had to go to the cross of Calvary in order for you to be saved. And you still have to respond to the gospel in order to be saved. And so the reason why this is used as an aorist active participle in the adverbial position is because, and the reason why there's an indefinite time as to when you receive your inheritance is because it occurs three times. There's three stages. You had to be predestined. Christ had to die on the cross for you. And you had to, at some point in your life, come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Now, so the hyper-Calvinists who say that you were chosen from the foundation of the world, but you don't need to respond to the gospel to be saved. They're wrong. You have to. But so are the Arminians, who say that your salvation is not based on God's sovereign election. It is. The struggle we have is that we can't see both sides of the coin at the same time, but we've got to realize they're there. They're there. Our salvation required three things take place, generally. God's sovereign election, Christ's work on the cross, and then our conversion to Christ. Now let's look at the proof of airship. Go back to Colossians 1.12 and we'll finish with this. Look at the proof of airship. How do you know whether you are a true heir of God and have heaven as your destiny? How do you know that you're a true heir of God? Look what it says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the who? Saints in light. Now, I know that the Catholic Church has said that in five years, Pope John Paul will be qualified to be a saint. Unfortunately, the Bible says that if you place your trust in Christ, you already are a saint. So if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're a saint. All the word means is holy ones. One who has been set apart from the world, set apart from sin, unto God. That's what the word means. And so what he's saying here is that this inheritance is for those who are saints. Notice it says saints in light. What does that mean? That means they're walking in light rather than in darkness. They are living out the Christian life. That is what is characteristic of their life. Now, does that mean that there's two kinds of Christians? Those that walk in light and those that walk in darkness? No. The Bible says if you walk in darkness, you're not a saint. You're not a believer. There's only one characteristic. You're a Christian and you're walking in the light. Now, does that mean that you don't sin? No, of course not. We all sin. But it means that there are new affections, that there's new desires, that there's new responses in your life. I want you to go with me, if you would, to Acts chapter 20, verse 32. Acts 20, verse 32. Paul says, and now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. 
Sanctified means to be separated unto God positionally. When you first got saved, you were sanctified in His sight and as God sees you, you're perfect because He separated you from your sins and He separated your sins from you. But there's another aspect of sanctification, experiential, how you are living your life. We are becoming in the Christian life who we are in our position. Experientially, you become who you already are as far as God sees you. And so we should be growing in holiness. The word basically means holiness. And so he says that this inheritance was for those who are being sanctified. If you look over at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, look at 1 Corinthians 6. Look at 9. Look at verse 9. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetousness, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will what? Inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of God. All of those sins that he mentions there are being used in a tense which is talking about a lifestyle, which is talking about something which is habitual, which is talking about something which is characteristic of your life. In other words, if this is what is characteristic of your life, that you're a fornicator, an idolater, an adulterer, an effeminate, a homosexual, a thief, you're a covetousness, you're a drunkard, you're a swindler, and that's what characterizes your life, you will not inherit the kingdom of God because you're not saved. Now, it's not saying that you may not have struggles with some of those things. I mean, you can probably look at that list and say, hmm, I, I, could, yeah, I could see myself maybe in one of those things there. But what is your affection? What is your desire? Is it your desire to, to follow that sin and to live in that sin and to enjoy that sin? Or is it your desire to pursue God and holiness and righteousness, but from time to time you've got to struggle with that sin and when you commit that sin, you know that you've done wrong, you're convicted in your heart, and you run back to God as fast as you can for forgiveness. There's a big difference between the people that continue to live in these and enjoy these and those Christians who fall into those and are miserable because of what they've done. Look with me over at Galatians chapter 5. Galatians 5, verse 19 through 21. Galatians 5, 19. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy. So maybe you don't got a problem with immorality, but are you, you have a problem with jealousy or outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, if this is your practice, this is what characterizes your life, then no, you're not in line for this inheritance because you're not a co-heir of Christ and an heir of God. Again, keep in mind, we're talking about a habitual lifestyle. If this is what characterizes your life, then you're not growing in sanctification. Now again, if this is something that you fall into, if this is a besetting sin and you struggle with one of these things, look at the affections of your heart. Do you, do you struggle with temptation and you fight it and you fight it because you love the Lord and you don't want to do wrong and then finally you just uh, do it? And then as soon as you do it, you're convicted by the Spirit of God and you come back to God? Well, that's the sign of a Christian. That's not the sign of an unbeliever. So where are your affections? But what is the proof of heirship? Are you growing in Christ? Are you being sanctified? In your experience, are you being separated from those sins and separated to God? Look over at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Hebrews 12, verse 14. Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification of without which no one will see the Lord. You know, if there was a point of, in your life where you made a uh, profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and maybe you walked down an aisle of a church, or you raised your hand in a service, 
and you prayed the prayer that the preacher gave you to pray, and you have seen absolutely no change in your life since that point in time. You, there's no desire for the Word of God. There's no desire to be with the people of God. There's no desire to know God. You're still living the same way you've always lived. You're not seeing a change in your attitudes, a change in your affections, a change in your desires. Something is desperately wrong because it says here, pursue peace with all men and the sanctification. That's the growing in Christ, the growing in holiness without which no one will see the Lord. If you're not growing in Christ, that's evident that you never came to Christ. There was something wrong with that profession. And that's why the Bible says we have to go back and examine ourselves to see if we are in the faith. What are your desires? You know, and again, I think we have to be careful. Sometimes the actions betray us. I think the better evidence of whether you are growing in sanctification is attitudes. I really do. You and I have to remember something. When you came to Christ, you brought baggage with you. We all brought baggage. Sin habits. Sin leftovers. It may take you a lifetime to defeat those things. And many of us will go into glory and have to, be, and, and have, to have some of that stuff perhaps even dealt with there. Because we all bring baggage with us when we come to Christ. And you may struggle with behaviors. You may struggle with actions. What you really need to look for first is attitudes. What are the attitudes? What are the desires of the heart? And you may be looking for great big apples and maybe you need to be looking for little buds sometimes. But what are the attitudes of your heart toward the Lord and toward holiness? Finally, the last proof of airship, if you just go over to Ephesians 1, is the Holy Spirit Himself. Ephesians chapter 1. We'll run into another one of those contrasts. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, 14. Let's start with verse 11. Also, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to His purpose, who works all things after the counsel of His will, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of His glory. Now look at verse 13. In Him, also, in him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed... Now, I want you to stop for just a second. There's that whole aspect again. You can't choose one or the other. You were predestined, but you still have to do what? You still have to believe. After hearing the gospel of your salvation, you believe. And then what happens? Then you were sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of His glory. The Holy Spirit is the seal as well as the down payment of our inheritance. The seal, the fact that He's a seal, it, it means four things. Security, authenticity, ownership, and authority. When you placed faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit was the seal upon your salvation, upon your life, that you are His, that you're going to receive this inheritance. But He's also the down payment or the engagement ring of our inheritance. Look where it says in verse 14, "...who is given as a pledge of our inheritance." The word has the idea of making a down payment, saying, here, I'm going to give you a hundred bucks, a thousand more is going to come. The Holy Spirit is God's pledge. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit now so that you will know that your full inheritance is going to come later. You have the nature of the inheritance, the means by which we receive it before creation, at the cross, and at our conversion. And then you have the proof of heirship. Are you growing in Christ? Are you changing? What are your desires and your affections like? Is the Holy Spirit in your life? Are you sealed with the Spirit of God? Do you recognize His presence in your life or does it seem as though He's not there? Are you convicted of sin? Are you comforted? Are you encouraged? You know, why this doctrinal teaching about our inheritance is... Why is it so important? You know, why do we spend an hour talking about our inheritance as believers. Because what you believe about your life has a tremendous effect upon how you live your life. It affects how you respond to life and especially to the struggles and trials of life. That's why churches that don't ever teach doctrine, don't ever go into the Word of God, have Christians who are so weak and fluttery. Because what you believe affects how you live. 
God wants us to know and understand what our position is in Christ. And He wants this knowledge to empower us to live life above our circumstances as we realize that everything that happens to us is temporary at best and cannot touch our real and future riches and happiness. Everything on this earth is temporary other than what we do for Christ which will go on into eternity. You know, while visiting my mom in Bernalillo this week, I was scrounging around for something to read while she and Nancy were preparing dinner. And I picked up an issue of Billy Graham's Decision Magazine and I I read this short article on the back and I think it would be well worth reading. Very short. I want to read it to you because I think it illustrates perfectly what we're talking about. The local sheriff had tightened the requirements for his deputies. They had to qualify on the firing range where the distance had been extended by 10 yards. Each deputy had 18 seconds to get off 12 shots. The deputy telling me the story was a personal friend of ours named George. He told us the day before going to the range he had been fitted with trifocals. This caused him to be a little bit nervous, but he still thought that he would at least qualify even if he didn't get his usual 100. Well, being a little bit nervous, when the range master gave the order to fire, he drew his gun, fixed his sights on the target, and began to perspire. The perspiration caused his new glasses to fog up, causing him to lose sight of the target. Since this was a no-alibi, no-excuses course, he could not signal the range master for help. He couldn't stop the shoot. He had to shoot. Then all of a sudden, he remembered something he'd been taught in the Navy. If you ever lose sight of your target, just keep and re- just remember and keep your position. So, with time elapsing, George just held his position and squeezed off 12 shots as quickly as he could. When he was done and had holstered his gun, he took off his glasses, wiped them off, and after putting them back on, he saw that he had hit the target every time. You know, there are times when as Christians, we for some reason or another lose sight of the target. And the target that he's talking about here is persevering and enduring joyously everything that is thrown at us. Tears blur our vision. Unexplained tragedy raises questions that we can't answer here on earth, perhaps can't even be answered on earth. Hard, callous, uncaring people dim our vision for life. In the midst of all this and even much, much more, we must never forget that when we lose sight of the target, we need to remember our position and we'll regain our perspective. If you will remember that you are an heir of God, a co-heir of Jesus Christ, chosen and predestined from before the foundation of the world. Your sins were paid for at the cross of Calvary and God brought you to Himself at some point in your life. And that because of those things, you are a co-heir of Christ and you will receive all that is Christ. Doesn't that put a little bit different perspective on what you lose on this earth? That which is only temporary? We need to remember what our position is. You know, Peter said this in 1 Peter 1, verses 3 through 6. Let me read this to you. Listen very carefully to what he says. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again, to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. What God is saying is that even now, if you've been distressed by various trials, keep in mind, it's for a little while and it can't touch your inheritance in heaven. It can't touch who you really are and what you really possess. It's temporary. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for the fact that You have been so merciful and so gracious to us in the fact that You qualified us for this inheritance when we could not have qualified ourselves. You 
qualified us when we were the enemies of yourself, when we were hostile to you, when we were against you. And we thank you for that. And I pray this morning, Father, that we focus on the fact that in Christ we are co-heirs, that we are your heirs, and that one day we will obtain in full and experience in full this great inheritance that you have for us. I pray that that would encourage us to realize that we are complete in Christ and that because of that we can endure and we can persevere with joy. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.